Back when I was in grade eight, I was in a woodworking class, and I can't remember exactly what I was working on, but I think I was sanding some kind of small stool. And one of my classmates came by and, as a joke, tossed some sawdust on me. I immediately reacted by taking a larger amount of sawdust and throwing it back on him. He then took even more sawdust from another table, threw it on me. I took more sawdust as much as I could, tossed it on him. And then some classmate from another part of the room shouted, fight! (laughs) And the shop teacher intervened, played referee, and and separated my classmate and I before we could start throwing punches. We walk out of class when class is over, and another classmate asks us, are you guys going to have a fight after school? Uh, This was North Surrey way back when, so this was not that uncommon, at least there and then. (laughs) I really didn't want to have a fist fight after school, but I also had this image that I desperately needed to maintain. So I said, yes, we are. We're going to fight after school. And so at about 3.10 p.m., this classmate and I walk out to one of the baseball diamonds behind our school, a small crowd of maybe 30 or 40 people gather. You may be curious as to how the fight went. Well, I survived to tell about it, so I, I lived through it. You know, I'm not going to go into all the details, but I got really lucky. I remembered a move from judo that I had you know, picked up way back when, and the fight was over really quickly. Now, I don't tell that story to brag about how I got lucky in a fight in grade eight. I share that story to illustrate how when someone throws sawdust on us or provokes us in some way, we naturally want to react by lashing back, lashing out in some way. And sometimes that lashing out comes as we square off and literally exchange punches. Sometimes that happens through insults that we lob toward one another. And sometimes that happens in a much more subtle way. So there's a couple. Let's call them Sarah and Tom. And if you're here as a couple named Sarah and Tom, uh, that's just purely coincidental, okay? (laughs) They've been married for five years, and they're discussing what to do on their vacation. Sarah says, I want to go to Montreal and spend time with my family. Tom says, I want to go to Tofino and just chill on the beach. And they have this heated argument, and now they're no longer talking to each other. Sarah used to get up in the morning and make pancakes for Tom, his favorite, for breakfast. And now she goes to the kitchen in the morning and simply makes toast and coffee for herself and then takes her food and goes to the living room to eat alone. She doesn't actually need to do that because Tom skips breakfast altogether, just comes down the stairs and and heads off to work, and he returns home real late. They're not talking to each other. They're in a kind of cold war. When someone tosses sawdust on us or an insult, or we get into a heated argument with someone, or we feel that someone is acting in a hostile way towards us, or if someone has hurt us through what they've said or not said, done or not done, or if someone, after we post something on social media, makes a sarcastic comment, or if we have someone in our life that we see as a kind of competitor, as a kind of rival, as a kind of threat that we envy, We can disdain that person, resent that person, and even at a conscious or subconscious level, see them as an enemy. Last week, Craig kicked us off with a great sermon for a new series called The Paradoxes of Jesus, and we're going to continue that series today as we look at Matthew chapter 5. If you missed the message, you can catch Craig's online. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, these words, they're about two-thirds of the way through your Bible. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now, when Jesus calls us to love our enemy, it's a paradox because It's our natural tendency to hate our enemy, perhaps to try and hurt our enemy. 
Not to love our enemy. That feels very unnatural, very counterintuitive. So it's a paradox. And Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. By the way, in Jesus's Bible, what we would call the Old Testament part of the Bible, God does call us to love our neighbor as ourself. So that's in scripture. But nowhere in the Bible does God call us to hate our enemy. That's not in the Bible. But it was simply assumed by Jesus's day that that would be a natural thing to do, and people assume that in our day. And so Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Let's go back to verse 44. And then Jesus continues, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven, like your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, and the Greek can be translated, be complete. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect or complete. Let's pray together. Living God, through the words of your son Jesus, you call us to do something really hard. You call us to do something that feels impossible, to love our enemies. And so we're saying, help, help us do that. Help us become like you. Fill us with your very life and your very spirit that we can do what is impossible for us to do. To love those we would naturally hate. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in our passage, as I mentioned, Jesus does call us to do what God calls us to do in what we call the Old Testament part of the Bible in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, and that is to love our neighbor as ourself. But Jesus goes on and calls us to something even higher, something a lot more difficult, something that may feel impossible, and that is to love our enemy. Now, let me clarify. When Jesus calls us to love our enemy, Jesus is not inviting us to have no boundaries whatsoever. In verse 39, in a famous verse earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. Now, let me explain what's going on here in the culture. If you were to stand in front of someone, in front of, say, David here, and you were to wind up and punch David, if you're right-handed, as 90% of the people in the world are, you would strike David on his left cheek. So that would be the natural place where your, your punch would land. So when Jesus says, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, he's not envisioning a punch or a violent strike. He is envisioning someone taking their right hand, most people are right-handed, and, and turning it like this, uh, and, and moving their hands so the outer part of their hand strikes the outer part of the person's right cheek. He's not talking about a violent punch, a violent strike. He's talking about an insult lobbed against someone. And when Jesus says, if someone strikes you or slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also, he is not encouraging us to be passive victims of violence. He is urging us not to be obsessed with our ego and defending our, quote, honor. Jesus is not discouraging boundaries. Boundaries are a very good thing to have. Boundaries where we express what is okay and what is not okay. Boundaries that are healthy and, and relate to physical boundaries, emotional boundaries, as well as time-related boundaries. Boundaries are good things, uh, and we could have a whole message on that if that were the, 
the purpose, but we're going to go back to the text here. Jesus says in our passage, love your enemies. Very difficult, very demanding, but very needed in our world. It's a cliche to say that we live in a divided world, that we live in polarized times. Here in Canada, we have divided views over how to see climate change. We have differing views on immigration policy. We have different perspectives on LGBTQIA2S plus matters. We have differing opinions on whether it's a good idea to build pipelines to carry gas and oil. And of course, our larger world is also fragmented and divided over all kinds of things. Professor Arthur Brooks teaches at the Kennedy School at Harvard. He's also a best-selling author, and he is a devout Catholic Christian. So I was thrilled when Arthur Brooks was invited to be the speaker at the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. back in February of 2020. The National Prayer Breakfast, so-called in D.C., is really an international gathering, not just of political leaders, but people from all walks of life, from various parts of the world. Brooks came to the podium, and he implored the people gathered, drawing on the words of Jesus, love your enemies. We live in a fragmented world. Love your enemies, including your political enemies. When Brooks was done with his message, he sat down, and then the president at the time Donald Trump came to the podium and said, Arthur, I disagree. I disagree. And Brooks, in another conversation, in another context, said when the president got up after I spoke and said, I disagree, he wasn't disagreeing with me. He was disagreeing with the teachings of Jesus. Brooks, in his message, cited Dr. John Gottman, who is considered by many to be the foremost expert on marriage reconciliation. Gottman, as you may have heard or may not have heard, has the ability to observe a couple, interact for less than an hour, and predict with 94% accuracy whether that couple is headed for divorce in three years or less. And Gottman points out that the single biggest indicator as to whether a couple will split or not is the presence of contempt. And contempt can take the form of sarcastic comments, hostile humor, and worst of all, eye-rolling. And, and Brooks, extrapolating off of what Gottman teaches, said, contempt is tearing apart not just marriages, but people in politics, on social media, and in all kinds of arenas. And Brooks said, when we feel the urge to show contempt towards someone or, or are experiencing contempt from someone else, we have an opportunity to live out the teachings of Jesus and love our enemies. But Brooks said, we can't do this on our own. And so we need to ask God to give us strength. He said, ask God to give you strength to do this because you and I cannot do this on our own. Ask God to make us like himself. And if we were to go back to the Sermon on the Mount, we would see Jesus urging us to do the same. We are invited to ask God to make us like him. And Jesus says, God, our Father in heaven, is the one who causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. God is the one who causes the rain to also fall on flowers and on weeds. And we are called to do the same as we reflect the face of God to others. We can pray that God would make us like the one who, according to Romans 5.8, demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, still hostile to God, still distant from God, God in the person of Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins so that we might be reconciled to him. 
We can pray that we would become like Jesus, who was spat upon, beaten, and then nailed to a Roman cross, and said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they're doing. We cannot live the paradox on our own strength to love our enemies. So we need to pray that God would make us like him, make us like Jesus, like the ones who loved their enemies and who loves their enemies. Is there something else we can do? Yes, Jesus says in verse 44, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who are hostile toward you. And in a moment, I want to talk about what it looks like to pray for our enemies, but I want to come about it uh, in a roundabout sort of way. Not long ago, I read a book by Johan Hari called Lost Connections, Why You're Depressed and How to Find Hope. It's a book full of great insights and very engaging. And in this book, Johan describes his friendship with a woman named Rachel. And I'm sure that Rachel gave Johan permission to share this, this story. But uh, Johan says, uh, we met at university and Rachel has really struggled with rage and, and depression. And, and Johan explained that he hadn't seen Rachel in, in several years, enjoyed her company, and decided to go and visit her in her small town in the Midwest. And, and when he, he, he saw Rachel, uh, Johan immediately thought, wow, she seems so much lighter in spirit, more joyful. And so Johan commented, you, 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 seem, you seem a lot happier. And Rachel said, well, you know, I've been given some tools to help me live differently. And then Rachel said, you know, I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed to say this, but I struggled with a lot of anger and rage. And a lot of that was driven by my envy toward others. She said, I'm embarrassed to share this particular example, but I have this relative, a cousin, who I have no reason to dislike. But whenever she really crushes it at school, whenever she has a romantic relationship that seems good or does, does really well at something, it feels like I am less than. It feels like she's putting me down. She's not, but it just feels that way. And Rachel said, you know, when I go on social media, it feels like everyone is flaunting their superiority over me, and my monster envy just runs wild. Rachel said, Johan, here's how I was dealing with it. I would see someone, say a couple, and I'd look at her and say, well, okay, you're gorgeous, but your husband is butt ugly. <laughs> she wouldn't say this out loud, I don't think, but just sort of imagine it. Or uh, she would look at someone else and say, okay, you may have a really successful career, but you probably never see your friends and you probably have no friends. And she said, you know, that, that technique would make me feel good in the moment, but it didn't last. And my feelings of envy kept dragging me down. And Rachel said, Johan, someone taught me this ancient practice called sympathetic joy. And I want to explain it to you. She said, Johan, I want you to imagine something truly wonderful happening to you. You fall in love. You get admitted to a school you really want to study at, and it's hard to get into. Or you do some work that you're really proud of. And I want you to imagine that because of this, you have these amazing feelings of joy just flowing into you. You're super grateful. And just sort of embrace that feeling for a moment. And then she said, Johan, I want you to do something different now. I want you to imagine someone that you deeply love and care for. See their face and imagine something utterly amazing happening to that loved one. And I want you to imagine yourself sharing in their joy and happiness. You just experience that with them. Johan, I want you to do something slightly different now. I want you to imagine someone who is a stranger in your life or an acquaintance that you're simply neutral about. Maybe it's the cashier at the grocery store. Picture that person's face for a moment and imagine something fantastic happening to that person. And even though they're just an acquaintance, you're feeling joy and, and happiness with them and for them. And then she said, Johan, I, I want you to try something that's going to be probably difficult, I want you to imagine an enemy in your life, 
someone who's hurt you or someone who is a kind of competitor to you that you maybe envy. Imagine that person and picture something great happening to that person. And if you can, imagine yourself feeling some level of happiness for them. Rachel said, I did this 15 minutes a day for three weeks. And and you know what? Nothing changed for me. But as I continued this practice, one day I noticed that there was less envious churning in my stomach, less rumination. And I continued to feel some envy toward my cousin, but it was notched down several levels. And instead of envying her many times a day, it it happened far less often. He said, Johan, the other day I was in a park not far away, and I saw a wedding couple getting their photos taken. And in the past, I would have pointed out in my mind some flaw about them. But as I saw them so joyful getting their photos taken, I just felt happiness for them. I I shared in their joy. That story reminded me of a prayer practice that I sometimes engage in called loving kindness meditation. It's a way to pray for others. And so it's a Christian practice. It's also practiced in some other religious faiths. But this is how, how I engage in it. Take a few deep breaths. And I remind myself that I'm loved and cherished by God, by my creator. Breathe that in. And then I'll pray for myself. I'll pray, God, may I know your love, joy, and peace, which is part of the fruit of the Spirit. And I just receive that as a gift. And then I imagine someone that I love deeply, really care about. And I think about that person, name them, and I pray, may she know your love, joy, and peace. And then I think about someone who's just an acquaintance, uh, maybe someone who works out beside me at the gym or is a clerk at a store near our home. I visualize that person, and if I know their name, I'll name them. If I don't, I'll just say, God, may this person know your love, joy, and peace. And then finally, I'll pick a quote enemy, someone who has hurt me, or maybe someone who I see as a competitive rival and envy. Take a deep breath, name the person, and say, may so-and-so know your love, joy, and peace. And I think over time, it's enabled me to feel a little more warmth toward my enemies. Uh, You know, not necessarily gushing (laughs) affection, but a little more warmth and a little less tension. And we can pray for enemies. We can pray that God would change us. And as Jesus teaches, we can also seek to love and bless our enemies when that opportunity comes up. Back to Professor Arthur Brooks one last time, insofar as this message is concerned. As I mentioned, Brooks is an author, and he says, you know, uh, with my first books, basically no one read them. I wrote them, but hardly anyone read them at all. And then I wrote a book, and someone really prominent, the then president of the United States, George W. Bush, sort of spontaneously recommended it. And a bunch of people started buying the book, and I started getting all these emails where people were saying, I love the book, I found it so insightful. But two weeks after the book was published, I got a scathingly critical email from a reader. It was 5,000 words long. It took me 20 minutes to read through it. And the email began, Arthur, you are a right-wing fraud. And it proceeded to basically insult every part of my book. He called me a stupid idiot in the email. He said, All your tables and columns are wrong. Most of them should be inverted and reversed. It was hurtful, Arthur said, to read through that email. But then this thought came into my mind. This guy has read every word. (laughs) And he hit reply, and he started typing. He said, "Uh, what the heck? I have nothing to lose. I'll never see this guy again. He typed out... um, It took me two years, hold away, two years of my life to write this book. 
and you read every word. Thank you. Hit send. Goes back to his work. 15 minutes later, he gets a push notification on his screen. The guy has answered. Opens up the email. The person simply says, Arthur, I live in such and such a town, and he named a city. If you're ever here, let me know, and I would love to take you out for dinner. <laughs> that wasn't what Arthur was intending or even imagining, but he felt a little bit of gratitude and a little bit of warmth because this guy had read his book, and he hit send and it changed the dynamic of the interactions. And when we love and bless our enemy, it may change nothing, but it might change the dynamic of the relationship or the interaction. When someone throws sawdust on us, insults us, acts in a hostile way towards us, hurts us, when someone in our life is there as a kind of seeming rival or competitor, we can feel resentment, anger and hate toward our enemy. But we are called to embrace the paradox of Jesus' teaching and love our enemies and pray for them as God changes us and makes us more like him, more like the one who causes the sun and the rain to fall on the flowers and the weeds. And as we do that, if we did that, collectively, around the world, we would inhabit a different planet we would have peace on the Gaza Strip if Israelis and Palestinians embraced the teaching of Jesus to love their enemies. We'd have peace between the Ukrainians and the Russians if they embraced the teaching of Jesus to love their enemies. If people in Sudan embraced Jesus' teaching here, there would be peace even there as well. And if we embrace Jesus' teaching, and love our enemies with God's help. It will shape our relationships. There'll be more peace within them. And at least one heart will change, our own. Let's pray together. Jesus, in our passage today, talks about being children of our Father in heaven, which in the genre and in the context means like our Father in heaven. And if you're here and you're not certain that you are a daughter of God, a son of God, in your heart you can turn to God right now and say, I don't get it all, but would you make me your own? Would you make me your daughter, your son? your child? Would you change me? Would you make me more like you? Would you cleanse me of my sins and make me like you, like Jesus, that I might too love my enemy? And regardless of where you are on your spiritual journey, if you'd like, you can pray the loving kindness meditation right now as I, I guide us there's no pressure to do this, but you're welcome to do so. You can face God in your heart and pray, may I, may I know your love, joy, and peace. And then receive God's love, joy, and peace for yourself. Savor that. And then if you'd like, you can imagine someone that you cherish, that you deeply care for and love. And you can picture their face. And you can say, God, may, and you can name that person, know your love, joy, and peace. And if you'd like, you can imagine someone who is a relative stranger, someone you're neutral toward, maybe your barista at your coffee shop or the custodian that you pass by at work or whoever someone who delivers your mail. You can picture them, and if you know their name, you can name them and say, may, and name them, or if you don't know their name, just say, may this person know your love, joy, and peace. And then finally, and you don't need to do this, I'm not pushing you to do this, but if you'd like to do this, you can imagine someone who is an enemy in your life, 
because they've hurt you through what they've done or not done. Or maybe they're a kind of rival, a competitor to you. You can pick one of those people in your life if you want. Picture them. Take a deep breath. Say, God, help me. And then you can say, God, may, and you can name that person. May even name that person. Know your love, joy, and peace. And as we embrace the teachings of Jesus to love our enemies and to bless them, may we become more like our Father in heaven who causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on flowers and weeds. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.